and welcome back to the Lighthouse. We are really running back-to-back -back sessions now and running a really tight ship, no pun intended. Next up is our journey up into the Innovation Constellation, where Bill Janeway is already waiting. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Your incredible guidance, input, and mentorship over the years has been instrumental. It's really incredible to have you with us. Now, let's remember, while, while we're at it, why we're here in this conference. We are here to explore new economic questions. And throughout this conference and towards the end, we'd like to converge on the 100 most pertinent questions that we would like to focus our future research on. Now, for this session, while you're dialing in and going into the Innovation Constellation, you can suggest your own questions that you would like Bill Janeway to comment on. How exactly that works, you can see in this short video. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question and each group of stars or constellation contains questions within a particular topic. You can find Questions Fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself, or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card, and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. With that, we're almost ready. Just allow me to make a quick check with the question moderator, Cecilia, check. Session moderator, Christina, check. Bill, check. We're ready to go. Let's beam up into the constellation. It's a new innovation. If you invented it, then we'll give you an ovation. Does it further intertwine us while it simplifies payments as it instantly connects us with the right information? Yeah, but it also shares your data sets and tracks your location so that your next prospective vendor knows you're going and staying. Oh, and it's addictive. There are 17 seasons. You can buy it or the counter, though you don't need a reason. Hmm. Innovation, it's on. But when's an innovation right and when is it wrong? History decides it as we sidle along until it blows up like a hoverboard or hydrogen bomb. Who can tell if an invention's made to benefit creation? Or if it's in its essence just destructive, inhumane, and not a go? And if it's both, then what's the balance of the gain and of the loss? Feeling lost, are we all innovation? Welcome everyone, my name is Cecilia Ricap and I am the outgoing coordinator of the States and Markets Working Group. And just a brief recap for those of you that are joining us now on the flow of this session as all the other sessions that we've had so far in the question fair. We will first hear, uh, listen to uh, Bill Janway. He will be uh, speaking within the Innovation Constellation where we are all in now. And after his talk, uh, we will have the chance to uh, bring to his attention some questions. And those questions will be the questions that all of us will be able to create during Bill's talk. To do that, remember that you need to go into the Innovation Constellation and suggest new questions. While these new questions are being suggested, you can also like questions 
suggested by other people inside the innovation constellation. And the questions receiving most likes uh, will be the questions that we will ask to Bill Janway after his talk. And those questions will also be the questions that we will refine, rephrase after his talk. So we will have the chance to collaboratively work together on some of the questions that will then integrate the innovation constellation. And eventually, if they are among the most favorite ones, uh, they may be part of the 100 most pertinent, most inspiring questions that will guide YSI research and projects in the near future. So with no further ado, I will just hand it on to Christina to present our speaker. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, welcome back everyone to the YSI Plenary Questions Fair. My name is Christina Musalahai and I'm a coordinator for the Finance, Law and Economics Working Group. Today I have the privilege of hosting this uh, moderation session, a uh, questions fair session with Dr. Bill Janeway. Uh, Dr. Janeway is a special limited partner of Warwick Pincus and an affiliated member of the Faculty of Economics of Cambridge University. He joined Warwick Pincus in 1988 and was responsible for building the information technology investment practice, leading investments including BA Systems and Veritas Software. Previously, he was Executive Vice President and Director at Epstadt Fleming. Dr. Janeway is a Director of Magnet Systems and O'Reilly Media. Dr. Janeway is a co-founder and member of the Board of Governors of the Institute of New Economic Thinking. He's also a member of the Board of Directors of the Social Science Research Council and of the Advisory Board of the Princeton Benheim Center for Finance. He's a member of the Management Committee of the Cambridge Ironet Institute, University of Cambridge, and a member of the Board of Managers of the Cambridge Endowment for Research and Finance. He's the author of Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy, Reconfiguring the Three-Player Game Between Markets, Speculators, and the State. The substantially revised and extended new edition of the book initially published by Cambridge University Press in November 2012. Dr. Janeway received his doctorate in economics from Cambridge University, where he was a Marshall Scholar, and he was also valedictorian of the class of 1965 at Princeton University. Dr. Janeway, it is such an honor to have you with us today, and I'll now hand over to you to take us through the most pertinent questions that you would raise. Thank you very much, Christina. It is truly a delight to be here. I have long believed that YSI itself represents perhaps the single most important innovation that INET has been responsible for, and this plenary confirms my, my sense of that. I'm going to raise three questions that address needs for innovation and three different domains of economics. First, in theory, in macroeconomic theory. Second, in the economics of innovation itself. And third, in political economy, where markets meet political processes. So let's begin with my, my first question. In 2008, Reality rejected mainstream macroeconomic theory, the dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models buttressed or rooted in rational expectations as their micro foundation. So the question is, how can we build a new relevant macro? Is it merely a case of trying to fix up with more or less ad hoc adjustment to the standard model? Uh, there are uh, initiatives such as Hank, heterogeneous agent, new Keynesian models. To me, these seem to a remarkable extent like the effort to add epicycles to the observed behavior of planets in order to preserve the Ptolemaic model of the solar system with the sun at its center, rejecting Copernicus and Galileo's insightful innovations at the core of our sense of the universe. In fact, for a relevant new macro, it appears to me that three conditions are required and three different approaches are available. First, we have to recognize that the very notion of general equilibrium is itself subject to fundamental question. I've always looked on the arrow de Brewer theorem and their associated in infinite array of necessarily infinite array of 
contracts covering all possible states of the universe as a logical disproof of the possibility of general equilibrium. The conditions necessary for it to apply can never, in fact, be realized in the universe in which we happen, for good or ill, to be born. The second condition, having rejected general equilibrium at a fundamental level, is to reject the notion of the rational representative agent, an agent who, on the one hand, is purported to know the model of the world, which itself is a correct model of the world, and as a representative agent, is her own creditor and debtor, eliminating the possibility of existence of a financial system. That, of course, was the perhaps most obvious point at which reality rejected this approach. So the third condition is that any relevant macro has to integrate the financial system with the real economy and recognize that we live in a monetary production economy, whether the output are goods or services. So the good news, the good news is that I think we can observe three different approaches, each of which are promising, each of which are being pursued. The first is uh, relates to or is derived from uh, George Akerlof's Nobel Prize lecture on behavioral macroeconomics, taking seriously the microeconomics, usually expressed as behavioral, although it goes beyond behavioral, it includes network effects, complicated feedback arrangements amongst participants in markets. But start with the behavioral micro foundations and work up to the aggregate macro consequences. A second place to begin is represented by a very new paper uh, just published uh, on the National Bureau of Economic Research working papers site in June of this year by Goodsman and our own Joe Stiglitz. Disequilibrium dynamics. Start with the observable macro behavior of the system nationally and globally that includes extreme and persistent departures from full employment. Take that seriously and then work down. As, as they put it in their paper, they, they suggested a better way to understand deep downturns is to think of the economy experiencing a constant evolution marked by high levels of uncertainty in which there is continual learning about the economy and the economic system. Occasionally, something happens to make it clear that the beliefs of at least many market participants were wrong, so wrong that there was what we call a significant macroeconomic inconsistency where contracts are systematically broken and plans get revised in ways that were not fully anticipated. So just as George Akerlof in his Nobel Prize lecture explicitly referred to Keynes's general theory as the first great work of behavioral macroeconomics, Goodsman and Stiglitz's approach, taking seriously the fundamental radical uncertainty on which economic decisions and actions take place, is also an evocation of the economics of Keynes, a subject that may be distinguished from what became Keynesian economics, and we'll talk about that a little bit further on. Um, finally, a third approach. A third approach has, in fact, been directly sponsored by INET just this year. Lance Taylor, a very distinguished and, how shall I put it, uh, somewhat uh, uh, distinctive economist, uh, has published an extraordinary, short, accessible, compressed tour de force called Macroeconomic Inequality. Taylor begins with the observed inequality of income and wealth as it has evolved to an increasing extent over the past generation and draws from it the obvious, again, Keynes observed this, the obvious macro consequences. As income inequality increases, and a larger share of national income, 
is received by those at the top of the distribution. The marginal propensity to consume for the system as a whole, on average, declined. Rich people consume less than those, and that is now in America, essentially the bottom half of the distribution, who must live virtually from hand to mouth or even be absolutely supported by the earned income tax credit and other forms of subsidy. So increased income inequality has macro consequences. It reduces aggregate demand relative to a more equal distribution. And then Taylor takes that extraordinary, that powerful insight and takes it across, across the economy, sector by sector, to see how under the impact of reduced aggregate demand, people are shifted towards the low productivity, low growth, set up with low, inc- low wages sectors of the economy, the low end services and gig economy, and away from the high growth, high productivity sectors of the economy, which shed labor. So the dynamic here echoes, but extends and deepens Stiglitz's insight and carries forward Akerlof's recognition of the need for taking seriously the real world behavioral micro foundations of any macroeconomics. I think that there is enormous promise to work along these uh, these different lines, as Taylor does, uh, and to some extent Stiglitz as well. It does involve taking seriously the meso structure of the economy, the sectorial sectoral intersection, which, given the quantity of data being generated from the digitalization of economic life, and given the computer power available, means that we can take input-output analysis, such as Leontief originated, and dynamize it in virtually real time, and read the evolution of the economy as it grows and develops uh, in response to these broader forces of disequilibrium and inequality. I think that there is enormous room for for innovation here and that you have the opportunity to participate in making it happen. So that's my first question. My first question about where innovation is needed. My second question, my second question goes directly to the economics of innovation itself. And the question is, well, what are the economics of a Green New Deal? If we are actually going to see a response to climate change broadly to include the United States under the new administration, however haphazardly it may take place given division of government at both the national, federal level and state by state. But what are the economics of a Green New Deal? And here I think we can learn from history and specifically we can learn from the history of FDR's New Deal. The first lesson, the first lesson from the New Deal of the 1930s was that public policy were a succession of exercises in experimentation. Often the experiments were incoherent. Often they were even contradictory. One of the first pieces of legislation FDR had Congress passed was an economy bill to cut spending by the very small public sector represented by the federal government, which was only 2% of the economy in 1929 and 4% in 1932. At the same time, Congress passed the National Recovery Act, which included an enormous $5 billion program at a time when the federal government was less than that in total expenditure by far, it was barely half of that. So Roosevelt simultaneously cut spending and increased spending at the same time. But as the New Deal evolved, it became apparent that there was a potential conflict, a conflict that was institutionally represented by two of the best known initiatives of the New Deal. The first, the Public Works Administration, 
created in 1933 by the National Recovery Act, was determined to be efficient in its use of resources. It was run by a most remarkable, utterly honest, distinguished member of Roosevelt's cabinet for 13 years, Harold Ickes, who was determined that there would be no corruption, that the output of the PWA would undoubtedly represent major contributions to the long-term infrastructure of the economy. And indeed, the PWA was responsible for the Tribro Bridge in New York, the uh, Bay Bridge in San Francisco, and in between the Great Dam, the Boulder Dam, and the Grand Coulee Dam, and other such enormous public works. But it was so efficient that its impact on reducing unemployment was very constrained, frustratingly constrained, so constrained that in 1935, Roosevelt asked Congress to create a new agency, confusingly, confusingly known as the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. The WPA's mission was to be effective at putting people to work. Unemployed men, largely men, to rebuild roads, to pave roads, to create new roads, to build sewer systems, to build water plants, in a very close collaboration with local political leaders. Corruption was undoubtedly widespread. The term boondoggle was invented in order to characterize the output of the WPA, but it put millions to work and it did leave behind some lasting monuments because among those people that put to work, of course, were artists and writers and photographers and the WPA's legacy can be found all over the United States. So the PWA represented efficiency in the use of resources, accomplished a great deal, but it took time and was frustratingly ineffective in the, in the mission of putting people to work. The WPA was effective in putting people to work, but was hardly efficient in the allocation of resources by standard economic measures. So can we, expand, can we extend that model to, to the green tech world? It seems to me we must. There are major projects such as the, the, the delivery of broadband access uh, universally across the country, but also across the world, the construction of networks that can be managed effectively and efficiently both in order to accommodate intermittent sources of energy, solar and wind power. But that also raises another question about the economics of innovation, because in order to be effective in responding to climate change, we need new technological breakthroughs. And here, learning from history means looking back on the history of the digital revolution and recognizing the role that the state, particularly the United States Department of Defense, played in radically accelerating the development of computers and all the associated technologies from silicon to software that made them do, enable them to do useful work. So when we look at response to climate change, one of the great needs is going to be clearly for radically enhanced, not just marginally improved, but different in kind methods of en energy storage that can accommodate at grid scale the delivery of energy from these intermittent sources. And here, two lessons arise. One is undoubtedly the need for upstream investment in the fundamental science behind that will enable such kinds of, of innovative storage technologies. It is the case that today, DARPA focused on military applications of computing to an overwhelming extent, is still funded at $3 billion a year, while ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, remains an orphan in the government, barely funded at $300 million a year, 
Since 2017, the Trump administration in every budget has proposed to liquidate it, to close it down. One of the first obvious steps for the new administration will be to elevate RPE to a much higher level, while at the same time taking the second lesson from the history of the digital revolution, using the public sector as the demand driver, the early collaborative customer that can pull the new technologies down the learning curve to low cost, reliable production where they become broadly available to the commercial private sector without the need for further subsidy. Now behind that state role, when these new radical technologies emerge, what funds their deployment to universal state, just as with the internet in the 1990s, is, is, is speculation, financial speculation. And here we do have an existence proof that with respect to breakthrough green technologies, speculative energy is there to feed it and fund it. And Tesla, of course, represents the existence proof that there will be speculative finance <clears throat> that can mobilize capital at enormous scale to fund projects which on their face would never be funded because the net present value of the future cash flows is so uncertain that it would not pass the conventional co commercial test. So in the economics of innovation, I'm suggesting that we need to learn from history, learn from the history of the New Deal about trading off efficiency for effectiveness, working both of those horses together, while at the same time remobilizing the state, both as funder of science and even more as demand driver for new technology to enable the commercial application to become available. Finally, third area where innovative thinking, new thinking, new political economic thinking is required. And the question here is simple and unfortunately one that we can hope we can, we, we can address effectively, but one which has been under great threat. Market capitalism and representative democracy. Can this marriage be saved? Looking back over history, what stands out is the resilience of capitalism over centuries, even millennia. The Cambridge History of Capitalism published in two volumes over the last several years, begins with Babylonia and works through to the modern day. Capitalism, that is, the ability of financial surpluses, surplus resources to be owned and controlled by limited sets of people who can realize the benefits and direct the application of those resources has been central, not exclusively, but very largely through all history where an economic surplus has been generated one way or another. Against that long history, democracy is fragile. It emerged in the modern world in the 19th century, rather haphazardly and incompletely. Even in uh, Western Europe, Women only got the vote in 1945 in France and later than that in Switzerland. And certainly America represents not just on the one hand, the first nation state to have universal white manhood suffrage going back to the 1820s, but a nation that still is struggling as we can see from the efforts of voter suppression over the last election to reach a stable, basis of fully open representative democracy. But here's the challenge. Representative, capital, uh, representative democracy and market capitalism institutionalized two different sets of institutions, which overlap and compete in the distribution of, re, of access and control of 
resources, one man, one vote, one person, one vote, one dollar, one vote, and then the distribution of power, market power versus political power. In the 19th century, the deal that was offered nation by nation was we give you the vote and you commit to not seizing our wealth. But it's clear that market power pervades political power through multiple channels. And neoclassical economics and neoliberal politics have been at the center of the modern struggle, the current struggle between these two sets of institutions. It was not just the University of Chicago's economics that played the key role here. After all, the neoclassical production function emerged from MIT, from what used to be called saltwater macro. Uh, but at the micro level, if the factors get their marginal products as specified by the neoclassical production function, then distribution as a subject of economic analysis or as a subject for public policy disappears, logically disappears. What could be more fair than the factors of production getting their marginal product? Now, the neoclassical synthesis that linked a macro basis for state intervention to assure full employment was exposed by the Lucas critique to the failure of having consistent micro foundation, as I've discussed in the first question, the ludicrous but successful promotion of the rational expectations micro foundation has run out of steam. But even while that theoretical buttressing of the elimination of distribution as a subject of analysis and of public policy has, has, has faded away and is under attack. There is another aspect of exceptionalism in America that has come to the fore. And this is the notion that constitutionally, the corporation should be taken as a person entitled to the rights of the First Amendment. This struggle is going to continue. It's going to continue given, the, the, given the, the makeup of the United States Supreme Court. We are going to live through the next generation, at least at the frontier of conflict between the distribution of market power and the distribution of political power as those who have been disadvantaged by the assertion of market power over politics push back. But we should also recognize that this conflict, this basis for conflict between the institutions of the market and the institutions of the polity, of the political process, is not exclusively uh, available, observable in nominally or fundamentally democratic countries. We've just seen this in China. The assertion of political power with respect to the enormous market power of Ant, the great financial spinoff from Alibaba, the postponing indefinitely of the Ant IPO at the instance of political leadership in Beijing, demonstrates that this issue of this fundamental issue of political economy, the coexistence of market institutions and political institutions who each claim legitimacy, not without reason, claim legitimacy in the allocation of resources and the distribution of the rewards from that allocation, that is fundamental to the system in which we live. And all economics is embedded within that broader structure. So with that, I'll be happy to yield to questions from the audience and hope to be able to address them in real time. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Janeway. You've given us so much to talk about and discuss. Um, I particularly appreciate, um, I think you refer back to chapter 12 of your book, Doing Capitalism, when you start off, <laughs> uh, when you start off with your first point. Um, and I appreciate that, that I think the chapter 12 talks about um, the necessity of waste. And so how there's this trade-off between being effective and being efficient. Um, so I really appreciate the fact that you started there, which led us into this conversation in terms of inequality um, and then, so there's so many different points. <laughs> and then which I, which, what I really enjoy from this conversation is this idea of uh, mobilizing the state, um, which I think is really important. And given other discussions that we've been having in this questions for yesterday, we had Marianne Mazzucato who made a similar point as well. And I think it's going really a step forward in driving this point um, home for us. And I think it is it's gonna lead to a lot of really interesting discussion. Um, and then just lastly, uh, I'll just point out this issue of distribution. And I love the question that you raised for the questions fair, um, because there is so many layers to it. And so where do we begin in terms of uh, distribution of market power and political power? Um, and, and sort of wrapping it all up around this idea of using real world observable factors to start determining how we respond is, is a really key factor that I, I picked up from your discussion. Um, but that's just my, my um, clarification notes and things that I, uh, that I picked up from this discussion. We have some really interesting questions from the questions graph, which I will read out to you. Um, just a reminder to everyone who's watching, uh, the aim is not for Dr. Janeway to answer these questions, but to reflect upon them and comment on the pertinence of these questions for the future of YSI research. So the first question that we have is, should developing countries attempt to catch up on the technological front or try to push into a new and different front? Dr. Janeway. That is a very interesting question. And may I refer you to a chapter in volume two of the Cambridge History of Capitalism, which I just happened to read over last weekend. It's by two scholars, Mork and Young, who have written extensively on the institutions in developing countries called, which they call business groups, basically family controlled extended networks of businesses, which overcome some of the market failures in an emerging economy, the, 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 the lack of contracts, the lack of institutional basis, the lack of trust. And these business groups have proved to be from Japan and Korea across now into Africa, as well as Latin America, enormously powerful institutions for delivering economic benefits well before reaching the frontier. But here's the problem. Those same institutions that enable follower nations to get closer to the frontier become obstacles when you reach the frontier. They are in the position, in effect, of establishing quasi-monopoly positions in markets. And the last thing they want to do is see those positions threatened by creative destruction, by destructive, new, innovative approaches that compete with what they've established. So I urge you to look at the Mork and Young. I myself, and I'm pleased to say in the book, suggested that in American history, you could actually see, in particularly the form of AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, which 50 years ago was the largest employer in the United States, which was based on a deal between the private and public sector. It received a, a monopoly in voice communications in return for delivering a standard service across the entire country. And it became, on the one hand, in its laboratories, an enormous source of innovation, of technical innovation, including the transistor itself, as well as the Unix operating system. But as the manager of the global of, of the national system, absolutely refused to introduce new technology and fought the the basis, fought the internet uh, at every level, from technical committees to conferences at the White House for a decade or more. So it's an excellent question. There's one last thing I do want to point out. Much of what I've discussed relates to this frontier between public and private sector, between the markets of the private sector and the political institutions of the public sector. And this question does focus on the need to recognize that at that frontier, corruption is endemic. 
It was true in the Britain of the late 18th and early 19th centuries in the United States, almost entirely across the 19th century. The volume of corruption was enormous. It was not, the corruption tax did not overwhelm the engines of economic development. But it's all too obvious that it can. And thinking about mobilizing state innovation, state intervention in the economy needs to go hand in hand with clear concern for setting up safeguards against the reciprocal rent seeking between public officials who are able to exploit their intervention in markets for their own gain and private sector players who can, not just through regulatory capture, but through outright bribery, take control of those interventions. We should take that very seriously and recognize that across most most national history, the corruption tax has been real, substantial, and all too often crippling, and not be starry-eyed about the state as a pure player in this complex game. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jamie. That's a wonderful reflection on that question. Um, we'll move on to question two. Can innovation and equitable distribution go hand in hand? That's a very good question. There's a, there's a certain thesis that successful innovation will inevitably reward the innovators with disproportionate gains. Uh, but that's where the state can also play a role. Two ways it can play a role. First of all, there is interestingly open and questioning research going on about the extent to which the intellectual property regime, patents and copyright, stimulate innovation versus stifling innovation. And there is an argument that I happen to share that to a substantial extent, the American property regime, intellectual property regime, has tilted more and more towards stifling rather than stimulating innovation. It's only about 30 years ago that the giant technological incumbents, AT&T and IBM, began to look upon their stock of patents as an economic resource and began to generate returns by suing people who they alleged, and of course they had the resources to go to court, who they alleged were violating them. And on the other hand, it's 50 years, almost, it's well over 50 years. It's almost, it's actually 64 years since a different kind of intervention by the United States government in the market economy, namely the antitrust suit against AT&T, not the one that broke up AT&T, but the one that was settled in 1956 with an agreement whereby AT&T would license royalty free its stock of patents to the world, and particularly to, the, to American companies, which undoubtedly played a role in accelerating the building of the digital economy. During World War II, when the Office of Scientific Research and Development was the engine of mobilizing technological innovation, scientific achievement for the war, the government retained IP rights, patent rights, in what was developed, and then was very generous, ran it through the Cold War years, a very open, almost scandalously open by modern standards, system of intellectual property rights requiring open, fair licensing of technologies that had funded. Um, and so I do think that innovation need not inevitably go with, need not inevitably go with the, um, with the um, increase in inequality that it can generate. Beyond that, of course, we've had 50 years of tax changes in the US that have not just, uh, have not far from countering the markets 
generation of inequality has exaggerated. Uh, whereas we can see in countries that have far less in an unequal distributions of economic income and wealth, such as the, the Scandinavians, they're in, 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 becomes increasingly they are sources of new innovations, business innovations, startups, Spotify is the kind of poster child for this. So I don't think it's a necessary, even though it's observable historically, a necessary conjunction. Thank you, Dr. Janeway. We have about five minutes left, so we'll speed through this last question, which is how do we solve the collective action problem in facing the global challenge of climate change if large scale and sustained cooperation amongst many nation states is required? That's, a, that's, that's perhaps the single most important question that faces us all. Collective action problems are extremely difficult and challenging to address. I apologize, this phone has now been answered by somebody else. Uh, they are hard to address. The, the one way I think about this, however, is that this is a common threat which inserts itself increasingly across every country. Miami is in the process of becoming Venice. It, flooding is becoming endemic. The wildfires of California are matched by the droughts of the Middle West in America. So the basis for recognizing a common threat is potentially available. What's more, what's more, as nations individually realize that their people, the people they are responsible to, and that may be a, an unequal distribution of responsibility, uh, are demanding. You know, it is the case that in the U.S., the Pew polls are showing 70 percent of the public, more than half of Republicans, as seeing climate change as a real and present danger. The need to collaborate will come. It's obvious that President-elect Biden has said, and I think there's every reason to believe him, that on day one, on January 20th, before the sun sets, he will rejoin the Paris Agreement. Perhaps the most extreme, the extreme uh, reach that I could offer, and the fellow who hired me at Warburg Pink is, more than 30 years ago, used to say, you can't survive as a venture capitalist if you're not an optimist. Um, and I am an optimist temperamentally. I see a basis for climate change being the vehicle that induces collaboration where it matters most between the United States and China. The United States continues to be a great innovator at the scientific upstream research level. China clearly is the powerhouse of high-tech manufacturing of solar panels, wind power systems. And while the, the Chinese have been more outspoken than the US in asserting, in the leadership asserting uh, commitment to respond to climate change, while the US has been in freeze frame of denial, uh, that clearly is gonna change in the US, while China will be also challenged to go from what it says to what it does. And that means stopping the construction of coal-fired power plants, both domestically and around the world, along the Belt and Road Initiative. And there is a basis for real collaboration. It, I don't mean this as a joke, I really don't. In 1938, no one would have imagined that a Great Britain, a British empire, led by Winston Churchill, would join forces with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics led by Joseph Stalin into a collaboration that proved to be, particularly when backed by the United States, definitively successful in addressing a common enemy. Well, now we have a common enemy that isn't another nation. It's, 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 it's the world, it's to save the world in which we all live. So I am optimistic that climate change will be the driver of transnational collaboration and in and of itself will force the a successful uh, addressing of the collective action problem. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamie, for your time today. Um, I don't think I'm overstating the point when I say we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you um, and others who started INET and by implication YSI. And so thank you so much for your continued mentorship throughout the years and for being with us today and sharing your insights. Uh, so this wraps up the first session 
of this question sphere. But please don't go away if you're watching on the live stream or if you're in the questions graph constellation, please don't go away. Please join us for the second session where we'll begin to rephrase these questions before they go up into the night sky of questions. But Dr. January, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Good and now back to the studio. Thank you. Welcome back to the Lighthouse. Bill Janeway, thank you so much for your time. This was an incredible session. Many, many insights taken. Thank you to all the participants in the questions constellation. We're going to go right back up there to finalize the questions that we've started discussing right now. See you there. Hi, everyone. This was a very inspiring talk, and many things were brought to the discussion. And I don't know if you noticed, but for those of you that were here in previous sessions, there were many topics that we had already started discussing. And that's why, on top of the questions that you suggested during the talk, I included two questions that actually were brought uh, by other uh, colleagues in previous sessions, because I think that they will definitely uh, contribute to the discussions that we are having here. So we have a, a very busy task today because we not only have three questions to rephrase, the three questions that were asked to Bill Janway and that were asked by, by people in this talk, but we're also, I, I would also like to invite you to think of rephrasings for two other questions uh, and also to like other questions that were already brought to our attention in previous sessions, as I said. So I will go one by one and I will invite you all to start rephrasing as I allow you right now. Uh, so you will be able to rephrase uh, different questions, as I said, all the questions that you have uh, as uh, in your in your right side panel, we will start uh, probably with the first question that was asked to uh, Bill Janway. And if we have the time, we will also have a look at the questions that I brought from previous sessions, which are the questions about what kind of welfare state do we need for the post pandemic world? Uh, this uh, is a question that was uh, debated widely by Bill in his talk and also Another question that, that was uh, at some point discussed, which is a question uh, about innovation and why does innovation historically take place in fits and starts or innovation bubbles. And, and here it's great that we already have an alternative phrasing uh, because we didn't have an alternative phrasing from a previous session. So maybe some of you want to uh, like the alternative phrasing there as well. So how we will proceed now? We will go uh, straight to uh, the question about uh, developing countries. I will read it out loud and you will have some time to think of rephrasings, uh, possible editings to this question. Maybe it's just refine it a bit or ma make it more acute or on the contrary, broaden the topic. So the question says, should developing countries attempt to catch up on the technological front or try to push into a new and different one? And this, uh, I think it's, it's a, uh, a very important and wide question. It's not only related to in the innovation constellation, but of course also to the development constellation. And on this topic, it was very interesting uh, what Bill Janway commented upon, which was that uh, there are some, in some ca cases, in some countries, typically countries where uh, we think that uh, catching up was successful, and he brought the examples of Japan and Korea, there are some national champions, but the fact that these countries uh, managed to arrive at a couple of national champions did not uh, lead necessarily to development. Actually, it uh, has led, and this is, I'm, I'm just rephrasing or, or interpreting what he said, but this, and hi Bill, he's there also in the talk, so you, you can feel free to correct me. Uh, but he was mentioning that these uh, companies in the end became quasi-monopolists. So at some point they, they were positive for the countries, but then when they arrived at the uh, knowledge frontier, the technology frontier, they started producing uh, uh, negative effects. So, so this is a very important question. And if you want to suggest rephrasings, it's uh, open for rephrasing. And you can, of course, remember that, uh, for instance, here we have a new 
phrasing. And you should remember that the question that was uh, submitted first uh, is a question that has the incumbent advantage. So this means that all the likes are in the first phrasing. And if we collectively think that the new phrasing that I will read in just a second is a better one, let's move our likes to that phrasing. So the new phrasing says, how might developing countries position themselves to reach for new technological frontiers rather, rather than to catch up to current ones? I like this phrasing more, so I'm changing my heart. And of course, feel free uh, if, if to comment on the phrasings. And also maybe uh, the person that suggested this alternative phrasing wants to motivate uh, the new phrasing, say some words on why he or she thinks this is a better phrasing. So now it's, it's kind of a split. We have uh, five likes for the first, uh, an original option, and for, for the alternative one. I can leave you just a couple more uh, minutes. And while you think about this question, we can move to the second question that we asked Bill Janway. This question says, can innovation and equitable distribution go hand in hand? And here we already have also an alternative phrasing. I will read it. It's uh, what would enable innovation to reduce rather than enhance economic inequalities. So uh, as, as Bill Janway was commenting in, in his talk, the, this, uh, this moment we are living in, uh, and I would say it's not only the US, but more broadly, the intellectual property regimes we are in are definitely contributing to stifle innovation. So how can we rethink about this? And I say beyond the US because probably you all know that in 1995 the TRIPS agreement was signed and this agreement in a way expanded the US intellectual property regime to the rest of the world. So, uh, and, and it was, uh, um, we may say that this was a turning point for many developing countries because as, as you probably know, uh, learning by doing and, and also uh, reverse engineering are essential for these countries in their learning process. And, and this was uh, seriously curtailed since the TRIPS agreement. So there is a big discussion here, a big discussion that goes uh, beyond innovation and, and inequality. It also involves the state's role. It also involves our conception of knowledge and how should we um, govern knowledge processes and innovation. So uh, I'm pretty sure you will all be uh, eagering to suggest new phrasings or maybe uh, introduce more likes if you didn't do it during the talk. And let me just say you that the first question we discussed, the question about developing countries is now on a tie between the two phrasings that we had in the beginning. So we should define this before ending the session. And also uh, we have a third phrasing, which is uh, should developing countries focus on appropriate technology or try to follow the developed country model? So really good rephrasings here. I don't know if any of the participants wants to speak out loud and, and comment on any of this, or, or of course, Bill Janway, if you wanna keep commenting, you're more than welcome to jump in. I like the second phrasing. You like this phrasing. Well, uh, we can. You can place your heart, of course, because everyone can like the phrasing, and and this is also good insight for others that are still hesitating about their uh, preferred phrasing. Now, the second phrasing actually is uh, the winner, and uh, there is still a debate going on related to the second question, the question about innovation and equitable distribution. We can move to the third question if you want now, uh, while the, uh, the, the second question is, is being defined. And uh, here we already have an alternative phrasing. I will read both the original one and the alternative one. So the original phrasing says, how do we solve the collective action problem in facing the global challenge of climate change if large scale sustained cooperation amongst many nation states is required? 
And the alternative phrasing here is what is required to achieve the collective action needed to tackle the global challenge of climate change. And I must say, I like a lot this phrasing because one of the things that I was considering when, when this question was asked to, to Bill Janway was, uh, should we automatically think that collective action is addressing national states? Because it is on some respects, but there are many other actors. And this goes to NGOs, think tanks. It also goes to grassroots movements, unions, and we should all actually be collectively engaged in climate change. So, so I like this phrasing. I have already moved my heart. I've seen that many of you have done the same thing and think, and I, I'm really happy with this rephrasing. Uh, since we have some time, uh, let me just go to the questions that, that were suggested in previous sessions, but, but we're also discussing this one, and, and I think it, it's, it's something new. It's not what uh, we've been doing in previous sessions, but we have this planned, and I'm pretty sure that, that as the days and, and the different talks come by, we will have more of this interaction between different sessions and it also speaks of the very important questions we are addressing and how interconnected they are and this is why we wanted to show you this with a galaxy of interconnected constellations with questions that are linked to each other uh, because we really think that these major problems should be tackled together in, a, in an interconnected way so so it makes all the sense to me to to share with you that in a previous session, this question was brought to everyone's attention is what kind of welfare state do we need for the post pandemic world? There were many different uh, phrasings, but there were two in particular that received most likes and they have a different approach, even though they are both tackling the welfare state. One is the, the one I've read first. So it, it stresses on the kind of welfare state that we need but the third phrasing says, what is the future of the welfare state in the 21st century? And they may seem the similar question, but they're they are not the same one. One is about our aims, what we should be building, and the other one is what we can expect after the pandemic, given the, the situation we're in, given the past, and given what we can expect from, from those governing right now, and the press, and, and also corporate power, of course, influencing government power. So, so maybe we can, uh, we can just say that both are really relevant. Uh, I don't know if, if in this session you, you are more inclined to one or the other. Uh, we can also envision a new one that, that merges these two. I think that this uh, would be the best. So I will try to do this because we can merge questions. So I will see if I can merge these two because it's the first time I'm doing this out live. But, but I think that that's definitely the the best option we have right now. Because as I was saying, um, all the likes are already placed in these questions. So if we create a new one that has both uh, topics inside, it, it will have just a few likes. So I will do that afterwards because I don't want to keep you here waiting a lot and I want us to have the time to reflect on this other question that was that I, I also uh, brought from another session, uh, which is why does innovation historically take place in fits and starts or innovation bubbles? I don't know if you, Bill, want to comment on this. Sure, happy to. Well, first, um, you have those are that question is really two different questions. <clears throat> the first question is why is there not a continuing stream of technological innovations, but rather there are clumps. Well, there's a great deal of literature around what are called general purpose technologies. From uh, steam power to electricity, <clears throat> the internal combustion engine, computing. Um, there's a, I, I, I would refer you to the work of Helpman um, and also um, the Stanford economist whose name I'm blanking on for a moment. But if you start looking for general purpose technologies, you'll see there's a, a general uh, thesis that from time to time, a technology emerges that has a very broad and un, a, a, an unpredictably broad range of applications, such as, for example, steam power or electricity. And there is a, then a kind of ongoing dance 
No, I'm, I'm Carlotta Perez and Chris Freeman have worked on this, but um, uh, I can picture him perfectly. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to make sure that I find him um, because he is one of the absolutely top uh, economists. Um, um, uh, I'll post this as soon as I finish. What I just want to say is that out of a core technology, uh, a range of applications emerge, often quite haphazardly, which then feed back to pull further development of that core technology along distinct different lines and produce a, a wave of innovations that become commercially significant. So that's one question. The, the first question is that I think we, we observe and indeed um, Chris Freeman and Carlotta Perez were early in, in uh, identifying it. These um, uh, core general purpose technologies that in turn generate waves of innovation and themselves become capable of generating more. There's a positive feedback process. Um, but second, the second question is, well, when, uh, how, does, how does this get funded when we don't know what the applications are gonna be? We don't know what the value, the commercial realized profitability of applications generated will be. And that's where uh, Carlotta's notion of the, the frenzy, the financial speculative bubble that we can see in the funding the British railways in the 1830s and 40s, the American railways in the 1850s, in the 1920s, the funded the enormous increase in electricity generating power and distribution, as well as something like 200 automobile companies in the United States. And of course, in the 1990s, the great tech internet dot com bubble that accelerated the deployment of the digital economy by a generation. Um, so these are two separate issues, one emerging in the, the, the realm of technological development, the other, the response to, uh, in the financial markets, to the perception that, hey, maybe there really is a new economy that's going to emerge and we want to be part of it. That's what I think we see with the extraordinary valuation of Tesla uh, as the first signs that we could have a green bubble, which we will need, by the way, as with all of these bubbles, most of the money that goes in to fund the acceleration gets lost. But we get to keep, as Brad DeLong put it, the, the investors lose their money, we get to use the stuff they funded. Nobody tore up the railroad tracks. Nobody pulled up the dark fiber after the 1990s. That's the Schumpeterian waste, if you like, that goes with technologically driven economic development. Jay, I don't know if one, you want to say something also. Yeah, Bill, while well, we have you here, it's a, it's a real privilege that you're joining us in these in this uh, question editing part of the of the session. There was a, a session that um, now has been uh, taken off off the screen, but that was suggested earlier, and that was something to the effect that uh, innovation. Uh, might not only take place at the national level, uh, and we're, we're, we've talked about cross-national, international uh, cooperation to solve something like climate change. Right? I, I saw the question also speaking to what is the role of subnational applied to, like for example, what East, you mentioned Tesla, East Germany, um, now trying to fund a uh, industrial policy regarding batteries uh, uh, and, and and trying to attract um, battery innovation for uh, companies like Tesla and 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 doing that at, at a subnational level. What well, innovating at the subnational level is, I mean, that I'm not quite sure what you mean that a specific state, California, uh, funding. Uh, new technological development is um, is to be desired, sure, but it is unlikely to be at a sufficient scale. Uh, what matters is to have a, an environment where multiple, multiple players get to take shots at goal, to have a relatively open system. Um, 
Historically, DARPA was pretty good at this. ARPA-E is so constrained with its resources, it's hardly relevant. Um, and it's both, it's both funding the, well, they, they, let, me put, let me back up to say, I don't think there's a research university in the world that doesn't have multiple laboratories working on innovative chemistries for en energy storage, innovative approaches to energy storage of all sorts. Uh, the problem is moving it from the lab to where you can get sufficient tests of uh, uh, scalability, reliability, learning by doing, coming down indeed the, the learning curve to low cost reliable production. And that takes a, a big customer that is not commercially motivated, that is motivated by the mission. This is where Mariana Mazzucato and I agree completely. That kind of customer is typically a national customer. You could imagine, you could imagine, for example, in the world of medical science, uh, transnational entities like the, the global uh, uh, vaccine initiatives that can play that role. The pre-funding of the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, that is commitment upfront to provide the market fund, the funding to buy and distribute and deliver what the science produces, that can be a very powerful, very powerful engine to accelerate innovation. But that happens at the national or even transnational multinational level rather than at the subnational level. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, let me just say that we received great phrasings uh, during all, all this part of the talk. And I'm very happy that we were able to discuss about many topics uh, during this part of the editing session. Uh, now it's time to uh, favorite questions. And let me remind you that liking and favorite and favoriting are different things uh, in the YSI plenary. Liking is something we do inside each question editing session. It's the hearts, we place our hearts to uh, indicate that we want a question to be asked to the speaker and that also that we prefer a phrasing over another phrasing. But now it's time to select the questions that we like the most from all the set of questions in our galaxy. And maybe some questions that were uh, discussed in this session are now among your top 10 favorites. I say top 10 because each of us has only 10 options 10 favorites from all that galaxy of questions. Of course, you don't need to decide all your favorites now. You will have time until Sunday, but you can start by choosing, picking some of your favorite questions if you already found some of them. So uh, you can, if this is the case, you can now just uh, click on the star of any of the questions that we discussed in this session. Of course, also the speaker's questions, in this case, Bill Janway's questions are also among the questions that you can favorite. And uh, feel free to favorite all the questions you want now, because even if you arrive at 10 at some point, and then you want to select more, you can just unclick and click again. So uh, with this, I want to thank you all very much for this session. Uh, it was very energizing, very inspiring. I don't know, Bill, if you want to say a closing words, and then we can pass it on to studio. I want to thank you, Cecilia, and all the attendees. And I want to add, Tim Bresnahan is the great economist at Stanford on the economics <laughs> of innovation, with particularly res particular respect to general purpose technologies. His papers are well worth reading. Bye for now. Thank you. So bye, and we pass it now to studio. Okay. Thank you, Cecilia. And thank you, Professor Janeway. That was uh, three very interesting back-to-back -back sessions. Wow, we've been going full on, and we haven't had the chance all day to see how the graph developed because we've been going from one session straight into the next one. But now we have a little bit of a break, so now it's time to take a look at the graph over here, you can see how the graph is developing. The questions you can see are only the question from the very latest session with Bill Janeway, but we've had three questions since we saw the graph la last. Um, now we are finally starting to get a hang of these sessions and what it means, how we suggest our questions, how the speaker comments on them, and also we're starting to see that this graph is evolving as the plenary goes on. Now the next step, because now we've uploaded almost uh, hundreds of questions into this graph, 
now is the time for us to start thinking about which of these questions should go on the final list. And that is actually a, a, a decision that you have to make. Everybody who has a profile on the plenary page can go in and select their favorites. And we've noticed that not a lot of people have started favoriting yet. That kind of means that if you go in and favorite now, you can give the questions that you like a head start and they're going to be on the, on the top of the list very fast because no one has favorited yet, but we are hoping as we go along that you guys are going to start favoriting. Okay, so let's have a look at it because we've, we've been to three different sessions in three different constellations. Let's look at the questions in there uh, and maybe we go to the development constellations first. This was where uh, Alicia Vazena was supposed to talk and we had Mario instead. And uh, now we can see the questions over on the right. If you click into the development constellation, first go to the whole night sky, click development, you're gonna find this list on the right. If you like these questions, they're going to have a little star. If you scroll all the way up to the top, Try to see if you can, yeah, you can see up in the very right corner that it says most favorited. That's the way that you can figure out which of these questions are the most popular right now. Who are other people favoriting? And that way you can see that now how could industrial policy help develop uh, countries in the 21st century is currently the most favorited question. After that, we have a question from Jayadi Gosh. She hasn't even given her talk yet, but already people are favoring her question and it's becoming one of the most liked question in this constellation. Okay, so let's move on to future of money because now Adair Turner was in there and gave a talk and there was a lot of questions suggested. This is the main graph. We're going back into the future of money. And this is actually, uh, yeah, we search by most favorited. We see that how should productivity be measured is one of the most favorited questions in this constellation. What is money is the second most favorited uh, question. How can increased government spending be financed? If you think these are the most interesting questions, well, you don't have to do anything. But if you think that there was other questions that were more interesting in the, in the sessions that you were participating in, well, go into the constellations, click around, explore all the questions that's been su suggested so far and place your favorites because the favorites is what we'll use to get to the final list. Okay, finally, the session we were just at was an innovation. So ha let's look, have a look. We've had a lot of sessions in innovation. We've had Mariana Mazzucato, and uh, Bill Sonic yesterday, and now we also had Bill Janeway. So that's why some of these stars are really big. They're big because they got a lot of likes, and there's a lot of questions in this constellation. It turns out that the most favorite question is by Mariana Mazzucato. How do we steer economies towards value creation and away from value extraction? But there's also the next one that I remember we made in that session. It was called, what kind of welfare state do we need for the post-pandemic world? So yeah, some of these questions have already been, been liked. If you think that these are your favorites too, that's fine. If you wanna have your say, come to the YSI plenary page, ysiplenary.org, click the night sky, explore all the questions, find the one that you want to favorite, and then let's see after the next couple of sessions when a, a few more people have had the chance to favorite what we are con converging on. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna go for a break. And then in 45 minutes, I think it's in 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, then we're going to uh, continue with uh, Jakob Capella. Okay. See you soon. Thanks. <laughs>